the call is being recorded. Um, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. And then we'll handle Q&A at the end of everyone's presentations. So remember to write down what you wanted to ask and we'll get to them at the end. And then I also wanted to introduce um, the speakers for this morning before I hand things over to Joe, just to say a few quick words. But um, I'm so pleased that we have Brent McKenzie, who is the Government Relations and Community Affairs Manager at Transurban. We've also got um, our friends from VDOT. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then Perrin Palastrant, who is the Director of Planning and Operations at OmniRide. So with that, I'll turn it over to Joe, and he is the Chief Development Officer at OmniRide. Yes. Good morning. Fortunately, I'm not the Chief IT Officer, otherwise I'd have some egg on my face this morning. But good morning to everybody. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll keep this very brief. Um, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, the Employer Council is one of our three mobility councils that we have that meets on a semi-annual basis. The other two being the Vanpool and the Hispanic Council. They are part of our strategic plan uh, efforts to kind of incorporate more community and regional stakeholder feedback, feedback into um, our service change and our ethos in how we operate. So I please ask folks to uh, participate and, you know, speak at the meeting at the end, have comments, send uh, questions and comments to myself or Holly. Um, and, uh, you know, we really want to have as much interaction as possible. We're always looking to change these meetings up and, and do them in different places and have different topics. So um, thank you for your attendance and, and please just uh, do participate. Thank you very much. All right. And with that, we'll turn it over to uh, Brent. And I did want to say I wasn't sure that Susan was with us. Um, so I do want to introduce Susan Shaw as well from VDOT. Thanks, Susan. And so it's going to be Brent and Susan and then Perrin and Brent, over to you. Good morning. And uh, thank you, Holly, for this invitation to join you all this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'll um, maybe just give a, uh, I've been out for the last week. I had COVID. Uh, over the last week. Uh, I know we were talking about it a little bit earlier. I too have uh, tried to join the real world and get back to normal and uh, it kind of bit me a little bit. So um, I'm not telling you not to get back to normal because I am going to continue to do so. But I will tell you that, uh, you know, this thing is still lingering out there and it's um, it's a beast. It's been, a, it's been an interesting week in the McKenzie household. Let me tell you, I had it and then my wife had it. We're both on the recover right now, though. It's uh, not still not fun, so be careful. Uh, so let me pull up my presentation here. You guys seeing my presentation or am I just sharing the, uh, the Zoom? No, we can see it. Fantastic. All right, so uh, was invited here to give you guys a quick update on our 95 Express Lanes Fredericksburg Extension, which we uh, affectionately refer to as FredEx. Um, I, use FedEx so much now that uh, I cannot use the term FedEx anymore. Anytime I talk about trying to FedEx something, I always accidentally say FredEx. So um, it has definitely become part of our vocabulary here at Transurban. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, this is a 10 mile extension of the existing I-95 express lanes. We're gonna pick right up where they uh, leave off there and um, take them down to around Route 17 at the Stafford, Fredericksburg uh, area, uh, building three new connection points at Russell Road, at Courthouse Road, and then down there at Route 17, and there'll be uh, uh, different connections at each one of those. Um, replacing seven bridges and two overpasses over I-95. One we completed last year at Trustlow Road, and um, one we just began work on a couple months ago at the American Legion Road overpass. Um, the, that work at the American Legion Road is scheduled to take nine months, and so we should be finished in the fall sometime on that project. Um, we broke ground on this back in 2019. 
We were originally slated to be uh, open later this year, but due to a myriad of construction challenges and, uh, and issues, we are going to be delivering this project about uh, a year later than we had originally anticipated. And we're all um, disappointed in that, but the project is on a much better trajectory today than it had been. And things are, are and going full steam ahead. Um, we're really excited about the, the progress that we've made just over the last few months. Um, we'll talk about that here in just a second. So what we're doing is, uh, we're just extending the express lanes. It'll look exactly as it, the other parts of the 95 express lanes do, two lanes right in the median, all the way down. So there aren't a ton of uh, community impacts. There aren't a lot of uh, traffic impacts, especially during the day on this project. Uh, so once complete, the new express lanes will provide 66% more capacity, will move 30% more people and 23% more vehicles. Uh, those are all comparisons that were made um, during traffic studies that were done pre-COVID. So, um, you know, kind of keep that in the back of your head a little bit. Um, it's being built with zero public subsidy. Transurban has uh, picked up the tab on the project 100%. Um, and in addition to that, Transurban is providing a $277 million payment to the Commonwealth. Um, we were able to bring forward a um, revenue sharing formula that was in the project that we probably wouldn't have hit for decades to come. And we brought that forward and uh, allowed the Commonwealth to advance a couple of pretty critical, pro pretty important projects there in the corridor, including the northbound Rappahannock River crossing project. And uh, my understanding is that they're going to use some of that funding for the project there at, um, at the Occoquan 123 there on I-95 as well. Um, construction of the project is estimated to create about 9,000 jobs and over a billion dollars in economic activity. Um, you know, obviously it's gonna operate under the exact same rules. So we'll have 10 additional miles of new HOV and transit options for you guys to, to play with there at the PRTC and at PAMPO. Uh, create some new bus lines and get some folks out of their cars and into some buses and into some carpools and move more people and fewer vehicles, which is the goal for all of us, reducing congestion. Um, you know, being able to transfer vehicles from the general purpose lanes into the express lanes through the um, toll paying customers, but also through HOV and through buses has really helped reduce congestion on those general purpose lanes. Um, we've seen and the express lanes corridor about a 20% reduction over the years and congestion um, due to that transfer. So that's all positive. So whether you use the express lanes or not, there's a, a benefit for all of us. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there's a new connection point there at Russell Road, which is important for enhanced access to Quantico, where there's about 28,000 people living and working on base there, uh, which is a big plus. Um, so as I was mentioning earlier, you know, we've made a lot of progress since just since January of this year. If you drive through that corridor, you'll see uh, these huge overpasses that are being built over the, uh, over the highway. We're lifting these beams up um, and building these overpasses. These beams are about 600 feet long and over 300,000 pounds each. We've been lifting dozens and dozens of them over the, over the highway. Uh, but what that does uh, when we do that, we have to create oftentimes some detours, literally taking all of the cars off of I-95, down onto Route 1 and shifting them around back onto I-95. Um, obviously not a lot of fun traveling through that. So, you know, it's summertime and a lot of folks are traveling on vacations. And um, I know some of my family, when they come to visit us here, uh, they like to travel overnight, especially with little kids, because they think they'll sleep through the whole trip. Um, but if you're doing that, make sure you check the expresslanes.com website, because there are often times at night that we're shutting down entire portions of I-95 to do these beam lifts um, and, and detouring folks. And that can create some, uh, you know, some traffic backups and not, a, not, not fun travel, but, um, but necessary to get these projects built. Um, we have another one coming up in early August. So if you're making travel plans in early August, definitely 
pay attention to what we're doing out there on I-95. Um, and as I mentioned, we're also rebuilding the American Legion Road overpass. And so there's a lot of work going on there. Um, and then in the median itself, we're doing tremendous work. You see a lot of activity out there as you're driving through. And then as part of all of our projects, we always have uh, operate a grant program. So if you work with a, uh, with a nonprofit organization or I don't know if PRTC maybe has uh, some, a small grant need that you might wanna look into, but um, we operate this great grant program that uh, has deadlines every quarter. Today is actually the summer quarter deadline. Um, and so we are always looking for uh, opportunities to fund things that help improve the environment, improve safety in the area, or just help out a community organization. Um, so some of the things here, you can see we've done a lot of tree plantings. We did some uh, new water fountains at a high school. We did um, some scholarships for summer camps um, and always looking for some safety programs. We've partnered with the Washington Regional Alcohol Program on their uh, sober ride program that provides free rides home during uh, some of the big holidays. So like the 4th of July holiday coming up, you're out celebrating and maybe you had a drink or two and you shouldn't be driving. Uh, you can contact uh, the Washington Region Alcohol Program and you can get a free uh, lift ride home. So uh, we're really proud to be a sponsor of that program. So that's everything I got, Holly. Thank you so much, Brent. Glad to hear you're better. Hope you continue to recover. <laughs> and Hopefully I sound uh, somewhat normal. My voice <laughs> in my head still sounds pretty cool, but um, I'm doing what I can here. You sound good. All right, and we'll turn it over to the VDOT team. Yeah, well, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. Susan's gonna- Okay. Good morning. Um, so is um, Justin, you're going to share? Okay, I see. All right. Well, we wanted to um, uh, give you an update about um, the 66, Transform 66 project. Um, we never came up with a catchy name like FredX. We're just Transform 66. But I think if you drive it, <laughs> I would agree that we have done that in this quarter. Um, so just a reminder um, of what our overview of our project, um, we are wrapping up this uh, summer and into 2022, a $2.3 billion project along the entire length of um, 66 between um, Gainesville and 495. Uh, when we're done, we will have two express lanes in each direction. And alongside of those two express lanes will be three general purpose lane um, in each direction as well. Um, a big part of our, I, we, I would call it transportation system that we're building in this quarter, our park and ride lots. And so we have two park and ride lots. Uh, one is partially open there at University Boulevard. Um, you can see the Balls Ford Road um, park and ride lot coming into view on 66 as you drive. Um, eastbound there, um, along with direct access connections that are being built with those. And I would mention in addition, there's also a parking garage that's under construction um, that is being built out of the um, $500 million concession fee that was provided at the beginning of the project back in 2017. Um, bike trails, largely in Fairfax County along 66, um, and then we are on schedule to open the lanes in December of 2022. Um, and then we will have a private uh, partnership with Express Mobility Partners um, that will continue through 2066. And um, also under construction is their operations and maintenance center out there off of Century Park Drive near the Balls Ford Road Park and Ride Lot. Um, just our, our timeline, um, you know, we're heading towards this December um, opening. Um, you can see the road does extend past that. And so I would just note that we are anticipating that we would have um, um, construction activities that would continue into um, mid-2023. Uh, we do have activities still on the corridor. Um, and so, you know, 
just like uh, Brett mentioned on the 95 quarter, on the 66 quarter, we have some significant, um, we're largely into paving activities, a lot of paving this summer, finishing the express lanes, we're finishing ramps, access points. You can see gantries going up now, signage. We're beginning to test the um, system and then working to shift traffic to the new, new lanes. Um, in terms of the um, new access points um, opening, um, of course, all of the regular HOV or the regular general purpose lanes access points will remain. But a big part of our um, activity is making sure people understand the new, the brand new access point, <clears throat> the entry points into and out of the express lanes. And so part of our, I won't, I won't walk through all of these, but just I wanted you to be aware there are maps that, that point those out. Um, and I'll talk about a few of those that are really, there are some that are really centered around transit hubs. Um, and that was part of the design when we did this um, study and, and determine access points was that was that was part of our focus, again, moving more people and where the express lanes do provide that space for transit use and HOV use, we wanted to make sure that access points connected them to um, transit activity centers. So how the lanes will work, um, I think everybody in our region um, is pretty familiar, hopefully, but there will be likely some new users maybe that aren't around the 95 quarter that haven't used the lanes in the past, um, but it will be very similar to our other express lanes um, in the region, both 66 inside and 495, as well as the 95, 395 quarter. So there, it will be a dynamic system with variable tolls um, pricing signage will be in advance of all the entrances. Um, there will be um, sensors to monitor the traffic and then um, toll prices will be adjusted as traffic flows a, a change. Um, you know, similar to our other systems, all electronic, no toll booths. Um, you will need to have an easy pass to transponder um, to enter the system. Um, HOV3 plus buses and motorcycles will travel free um, with an easy pass flex switch to the HOV mode. Um, and that's the same, you know, easy pass that you use in all other of our other systems. Um, on inside the beltway, um, you know, those will continue to operate during the same time periods and same hours that they do today. Um, and they will have the same rules. So really no change here, except that um, this is a quarter that is converting from HOV2 to HOV3 when we add in or when we open our outside beltway uh, toll, uh, tolling or an express lanes. Um, and so a big part of our um, outreach and education that will happen over the next six months is going to be focused on this switching the requirement from HOV2 to HOV3 in the quarter. And I would note that this also includes the tail end of the 66 quarter. So from Haymarket to Gainesville, uh, we don't have it, we will not have express lanes, but we do have an HOV lane there. And that uh, will also switch to HOV3. Um, when the um, express lanes open in um, December. Um, so this is gonna be a big change for travelers and something that, will, uh, that we will wanna make sure that we um, you know, communicate. And so to that end, and I know some of you might've participated in a meeting we had um, last week, I believe, on um, where we focused on that. Um, and we are work, that meeting was to reach out to various agencies and jurisdictions to try to leverage their communication around this change. I do think this is one of the biggest things that will be important for us to communicate. Um, so part of our uh, work at VDOT is that we are working to 
also communicate about the benefits of carpooling or taking transit on the 66 express lanes. And Fatima is with us today, as well as Bill Linkos um, to answer any questions. Um, but we just continue our um, transportation management and offering uh, support try to encourage these um, types of activities. We wanna make sure people know it is free to travel on the express lanes if you have three or more people. Um, we wanna make sure that um, there are new opportunities and people are aware of the new opportunities through additional uh, bus service um, and have the seamless connectivity in the region with our other systems. Um, there will be direct connections at the Beltway to be able to connect into the 495 express lanes. Um, and you know, all of this really supports our goal of moving more people and providing more choices um, and, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So I talked a little bit about the new park and ride lots. Um, you can see here on um, the top picture that is the uh, Balls Ford Park and Ride lot with the new access um, in the, that will be directly into the median there. And um, so that provides about 1300 spaces. And then on the bottom photo there, you can see the university park and ride lot, which has been open for some time. Um, I will say the university lot um, was get, picking up quite a good bit of uh, usage there uh, before COVID hit. And then of course we saw it um, pretty much uh, disappear, but it is starting to build. And it's, it's, you know, there are people parking there. You can see in the photo there, there's some vehicles there. It's partially open. And that's without having the direct access that you can see. If you look in the middle of that bridge deck, you can see the um, ramps that are um, coming um, into view as the construction is completed. So, um, you know, those are all important. And, and moving to the east, there are some direct connections then um, that buses will have um, as part of our project. So we have built ramps at the Vienna Metro Station. Um, you can see this is at Vaden Drive. Um, those ramps in the in the photo 66 is um, DC is to the the left of the photo and um, you can see the ramps are going to and from the west that will be able to bring you right up to the Vienna Metro Station um, and either you know either you could be accessing that so that you can get on a train or um, you know connect to bus service and or metro service there. Um, and then of course, with the connectivity into 66 inside, you'd also be able to access direct connections at other uh, metro stations as well. And you see some of those listed there. Um, we recently improved the access at the West Falls Church um, Metro Station as well. Um, so that will help hopefully with just making those connections um, between transit and the roadway. Um, in terms of our own plan, uh, this is what Fatima and Bill do such a great job uh, leading our team. Um, this, so we have a number of initiatives that are underway. Uh, we are, um, of course, the project itself is providing annual transit payments um, for the project um, through the Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Um, there was a $21 million payment roughly that was made last June, another one that is um, being made this June, um, and then there will be additional payments in 2023. And DRPT is uh, distributing, distributing those funds. I know some have come to PRTC um, to help with bus purchase. Um, they can also be used for bus operations. Um, and so that will continue those payments. Their semi-annual payments um, is how they've been set up in the um, comprehensive agreement and they will go through the year 2065. Um, they, they do change, I would just say. So um, from year to year, they may vary um, depending on what we had um, envisioned in terms of the transit needs when we did the original transit study. Then on outside the Beltway, our trans, 
tra transportation demand management plan. Um, so we, again, um, are looking at um, um, that that plan was done by led by DRPT and that was the um, just that was where the plan described the services that would be funded um, by the annual um, transit payments and that DRPT has intermittently updated that I know they did an update to the plan in 2020 um, and so they continue um, I think they will continue to update that plan every five to six years just to assess, you know, what are the transit needs in the quarter, how best to utilize those annual um, transit um, funds. And so you can see at the bottom there some of the services that they've um, provided funds for. So um, largely, um, initially, it's been focused on new and expanded bus service. Um, by both Fairfax Connector and OmniRide. Um, it also has gone to support the potential future expansion by VRE to add another, um, another additional service on the Manassas line. And then it's also going um, to the Commuter Choice Program with supplemental funding to the Northern Virginia Transportation Commission. Okay, now I'm getting, sorry, I probably was a little ahead of myself, but the program that um, Bill and Fatima are handling. So we are continuing to um, provide bus, van, pool, and carpool incentives um, for the I-66 express lanes. Um, so we have a bus incentive for the Fairfax connector buses on I-66 that have access to the Vienna Metro. Um, and then we also have our supporting half price fares on Omni ride um, commuter buses from Gainesville and Manassas. Um, we have van pool incentives um, for forming new van pools. And I think um, we just had two new van pools, which we had not had that for quite a while. Um, it's good to see that picking back up. And then of course, carpool incentives. Um, and we actually are focusing quite a bit on the new carpool, on getting new carpools. And that's again, um, because of this really change that we're asking people to do to move from HOV2 to HOV3. Um, um, we, we are continuing to maintain our website. Um, so we've got um, a number of um, places where people can still you know, communicate with us, which we anticipate you know, there will be a need for that of course, our website is focused on um, construction activity and um, moving how you can move through the corridor um, during construction. Um, I will say that um, our um, partner EMP um, is also standing up a website um, and they uh, their website will be focused on their customers and creating information, having information really about how to use the lanes as these lanes get up and running. Um, so with that, I'm going to open it up for questions or turn it back to Holly, I guess. Thank you so much, Susan. And I'm going to cue things up on my end um, for Perrin. There we go. Great. Thank you so much, Holly. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Perrin Palestrant. I'm the Director of Operations and Operations Planning with OmniRide. And I just have a brief presentation on some things that we're working on and what our future holds for us. Next slide, please. The big thing, as is, has been the theme this morning, is with the Western service changes related to the I-66 express lanes opening. Uh, myself and my team, we've been working really hard and coming together with a lot of different plans for this service. And at our July 7th commission meeting, we'll be seeking authorization to go to public hearing and public comment on them. So I'm going to touch on them very briefly since it's not made public yet as far as what the changes are. I'm just going to go over them at a very high level. But as soon as the agenda is finalized and publicized and with all the detail, we could send that out just so you have more detail as far as exactly what we have planned. 
Um, but the main thing is the new Balls Ford Road commuter lot opening up along with the I-66 express lanes themselves. The plan is to have several restructuring um, options of our services that are taking that operate out there. We have a few commuter routes that would be shuffling around the different commuter lots based on the new openings that are occurring. Um, another one would be to restructure another route to serve an additional commuter lot on its way along I-66 to try to maximize all the investment that's been made in these commuter lots. And with the direct access to the express lanes, I foresee a nice bump in our ridership on the horizon. We're already doing really well now. Um, we're well over 50% of pre-pandemic on our commuter side, which is ahead of the pace of every commuter system in the area. We're ahead of Loudoun, we're ahead of VRE. So we're, we're really doing well in terms of getting our people to come back, uh, primarily along the Pentagon routes. Those are doing very good right now. Um, other things that we're proposing are some um, increased frequencies to our busiest local route, the Route 65 that operates from downtown Manassas to Nova. We have some interesting proposals with that along with the increased frequency. So um, stay tuned for what those would be as well. And the other big thing is the reintroduction of all day service on Route 60, which is our Met Manassas Metro Express that operates from Manassas to Tyson's. Um, before 2016, we used to run all day service on that route going back and forth between Manassas and Tyson's. It used to serve portions of Route 28. And then we had to cut it back in 2016 due to some funding shortfalls. Now with the um, DRPT uh, funding opportunities that we had using their new TRIP grant, the Transit Ridership Incentivization Program, I applied for a grant to reinstate that service back where they would pay for the peak service and we pay for the off peak service. And that's in the six year plan. So that's going to be very exciting for us to be able to reinstate that service. And also both the route 65 and the 60 would go back onto Manassas mall property. Um, in December, 2019, when we restructured our Western services, we removed service at the request of the mall um, to, to go onto Rick's loop, but then there's been some change in some management and change in some relationships and we're gonna bring the service back on there. We're in the process of working on an agreement just to make sure that everything is good once we do go back on property there. Next slide, please. One of the other exciting things that we're doing um, in December as well is introducing micro transit service to the Manassas and Manassas Park area. This is taking over for an underutilized fixed route that we have in that area, the Route 68. That was a new route that came about from our restructure that we did in 2019. And with all routes, when you start something new, you, you have to give it a little bit of time to see what happens with it when it matures. It turned out this route wasn't meeting the ridership, um, the ridership outcomes that we were desiring of it compared to the other two routes that are in the system. But now we have some different opportunities to serve transit in that community, just not with the same big bus. This would be using smaller vans on demand, similar to Uber and Lyft, but it'll be an OmniRide specific service using OmniRide vehicles, using OmniRide staff, and it'll bring a familiarization to it that you don't get with Uber and Lyft. And in the green area on this map is the area that we'll be serving, which is much larger than we can serve with a fixed route operating every 90 minutes through there. So we see this as being a catalyst to not only enhance the route that we had there for the existing passengers, but to penetrate into areas that don't have transit currently and allow them to connect in with existing transit or to travel within the existing zone that we have there. And then that is the impetus and hopefully pushing us into looking at this type of service throughout the county where we do have transit holes, where it could support transit, but maybe not a big bus. Um, it also helps in areas where maybe the bus isn't quite as heavily utilized and we can reallocate resources. In fact, with this micro transit, we're able to take the bus um, resource and shift it over to the increased frequency of the 65. So in this case, we're not just eliminating a bus and replacing with microtransit. We're replacing with microtransit and we're able to enhance the existing local bus network too. So it's a win-win for everybody. Next slide, please. 
One of the other exciting um, prospects that we have here is coming by way of the DRPT funding, the outside the Beltway I-66 funding, is proposed service from the Balls Ford commuter lot to Reston. This will be brand new service that we have. Uh, it would start in December along with the other changes that we have made. And um, the public hearings and outreach will take place in the summer and fall of 2022. Next slide, please. This is a proposed map of the route. This is the rest in area. The rest of the route is just on the highway, so there's really nothing to see there. But this is the, the part of rest in that we'd be serving with the route. It would connect in with the new Innovation Silver Line Station, several stops along Sunrise Valley and Sunset Hills Road on both sides of the Dulles Toll Road. We'd be following a lot of the Fairfax Connector stops in that area. And then it would come back over 267 and then serve the US Geological Survey. We know there's a lot of residents of Prince William County that do commute into that area. And we see this as an opportunity to introduce service here. It'll allow people to connect in with the Silver Line to go to Dulles Airport and in other areas of Fairfax County. Since there is robust Fairfax connector bus service there, our route will interface directly with it. And then people can transfer in and go to other areas or even to Loudoun County Transit. And then for the first time, we'll have a real direct connection to cross counties to go from Prince William County, not only to Fairfax, but into Loudoun County and back and forth as well. Next slide, please. This is just a, a timeline of what we're working on. We're trying to get the implementation. We have a lot to do here. July 7th is just the start of it with what would be our authorization to go to public hearing. But in August and September, we anticipate a lot of public outreach, a lot of um, public comment time. We don't just have a public hearing just for the sake of having a public hearing. We're going to make sure that we're going out into the field to the commuter lots, talking to our passengers, riding the buses, having established areas where people can submit those comments to us. Because this is, we don't do this in a vacuum. These are our proposals. This is based on data that we have. This is based on plans that are out there. But we also want to have an opportunity for the comments from the public in case there's something that we missed or anything that we want to add, reallocate, we have plenty of time to make any kind of changes in case there's something that comes out of nowhere that maybe we didn't see. Um, initially, the schedules that we are putting together for the routes that serve the I-66 express lanes, they're estimates at the moment since they're not open. So we're just using basic math. In 10 minutes, you can go, you can, you can, they're going 60 miles an hour, you can go 10 minutes on on the highway, for example. But until the lanes open and we get some real-time data from there, the next service changes after that, we'll tweak the route some more. In case we get to save even more time than we anticipated, I like to be a little bit conservative at first and not over-promise and under-deliver. I'd rather have a little too much time in there at first and then we tweak it from there and we'll take away time if we need to. Next slide, please. The other um, big service change that we have coming online is uh, our proposed Sunday Eastern local bus service. Currently, it operates weekdays and Saturdays. Our proposal would be to mimic our Saturday service on Sunday. So it'll be the same routes that operate on Saturdays at the same frequency, same span of service. So it'll be your Dale City, Dumfries, Woodbridge, Lakebridge Route 1, and the Prince William Metro Express service that connects Woodbridge to Springfield. Um, we we're going to the board in July with that um, recommendation to move forward with it. It is in our approved budget, so at least the financially it's there. So we just need the official authorization. Um, we did a robust outreach for this. We had a whole day here at the transit center where we reached out directly to our customers that were transferring to and from their buses. We had a public hearing that was well attended. We received more than a dozen email com comments uh, supporting this. And then we had a, an onboard survey where we had over 250 responses, about 94, 95% of them were in support of it. So we had really good um, support from our community, good, good feedback from them as well. Next slide, please. And this is just our timeline of this as well. The proposal would be to start August 28th after we get um, hopefully our authorization on July 7th. I don't wanna speak ahead of them yet until they actually vote on it. And then what, if we do get the approval, then we'll spend between July and August doing the outreach to the passengers and reminding them that the service is starting. We'll reach out to the business community on the Eastern side, making sure that churches, um, employment uh, centers, 
HOA's apartments, everybody knows about the service so we can get a lot of support behind it. Next slide, please. The next big project after all this will be looking at our Eastern local bus routes. As I mentioned earlier, our Western routes were restructured in December, 2019. That was a much smaller footprint with a smaller service area. The Eastern side is a very large service area with a lot of passengers and a lot of complexities to it. So as we start to pivot to transitioning over to Eastern local restructure, we're going to start off small with it. We'll, we'll do one area at a time get one side going, learn from it, tweak it, then go on to the next part. And then over the course of a year, year and a half, we can get the whole Eastern side restructured. The, the goal would be to start this in spring of 2023. So we're in the planning phases now of looking at what that would look like, developing where other transfer hubs would be throughout the Eastern side, because it wouldn't just be just the transit center where there's transferring opportunities. It could be at the Woodbridge VRE, or someplace along Old Bridge or someplace down along South Route 1. So we have to look at those areas to see what's conducive for multiple buses to connect with each other. Um, so if, if you have any thoughts or ideas that you'd like and, and any options that maybe we're not looking at or be willing to allow space for bus stops and hubs, we're all years on that. We wanna work with the community to make sure we're serving the best that we can. Um, the other thing is with the Stonebridge commuter garage, known as the Neapsco garage over at the Stonebridge shopping center, that is um, looked at to being our new Eastern hub to replace the transit center. Right now, the transit center is the hub because that's all there is. But once the garage opens up, we wanna be able to have the hub go to where there are jobs, where there are services with Centera Hospital across the street, with the shopping center and the parking lot there. We would still serve the transit center with a route or two for people that do have business here or for employees that do use transit. Personally, I use the bus every now and then to come to work. So I definitely wanna see a transit route still come here so I could take advantage of it as well. Um, and then we'll be doing a lot of outreach on this too. This is not just gonna be a public hearing type thing. We're gonna be really pounding the pavement and getting support for it, listening to our community and doing the best that we can with the services. Next slide, please. We're in the finishing phases of our zero emissions bus study. I've been leading this since uh, fall of 2021, and we're just waiting on a draft of the final phase of it. And what we're doing is we're just learning a lot about the various opportunities there are for zero emissions, understanding what the technologies are, what the benefits are. There's definitely drawbacks to it as well. So we're trying to weigh those two as we go through our transition plan with our fleet. Um, also looking at training that we need for the staff, partnership opportunities with utilities, with our regional transit partners, with, with our the entities in the area as well. And then looking at the overall environmental impact. And it's more than just the, the tailpipe environmental impact. It's also environmental impact on our customers. Right now with the limited range that some of the battery electric buses are getting, the last thing we wanna do is introduce a new technology and have it be worse service than what they have now. So there's that to take into consideration as well. In some regard, some, some cases you do need two buses to replace one diesel bus. And so we have to look at that and make sure that if we're making this investment, that that's the best use of public funding, that that's providing the best service for our customers as well. Next slide, please. This is an overall scope and schedule of our project overview. Overview. We're into the last section with the late spring, early summer. I think it's gonna be more towards late summer that we actually get this finalized, but we're still relatively on target and I'm pleased with the direction that it's been heading in. Next slide, please. This is a little summary of what we do know about the technology overview. We do know that um, for zero emissions, there's the battery electric, there's also hydrogen fuel cell, which I'm really interested in, especially for our commuter services that don't lend itself as well for a battery electric as do your, your typical local stop and go type routes. Um, and then we're also, you know, considering, you know, looking at what, what are these other non-zero emissions um, opportunities. We're not really looking at electric hybrid or plug-in electric hybrid, but that's what other agencies are using right now. We use clean diesel. So on the surface, it still is cleaner than diesel used to be. 
it's certainly cleaner than 50 cars driving instead of 50 people on a bus, but it's definitely not as clean as we can get to with going to hydrogen or battery electric. There's renewable natural gas that we've been talking to Washington Gas about. Um, there's a lot of opportunities coming. So stay tuned. We're fully committed to transitioning our fleet over to it, but we've got to do this right and not just do it because that's the flavor of the, the day. Next slide, please. What we're learning though is exactly one, one fuel type does not fit all. As I mentioned, commuter bus has a lot different duty cycles in a, a different environment than a local bus. So you could see a situation where maybe we have a battery electric fleet for a local bus and a hydrogen fleet for commuter bus, for example. It might be a, a, a multiple, multi-pronged effect that we do with that. Um, the other thing is we're talking to each other, dash, um, D dot in the area with the DC circulator, they're transitioning over to electric buses. They're learning a lot from it. We're learning a lot from them as what some of the drawbacks are and what some of the benefits are. And that's allowing us to go to the manufacturers and telling them what it is that we want and not just taking what they say that we need. And so that's important to have that two-way conversation going with the with the industry to make sure that we're not just jumping into something and then in I think we lost Perrin's audio. Yeah, Raymond, I had the same experience. And it looks like we lost his video as well. It looks like uh, everybody in the office again. I will contact Joe. Do All right, I think we have uh, Lakesh is still on, but uh, it looks like Joe is has rejoined the meeting. Come Again, my apologies, people. Uh, hang on, I'm going to start my video, and I'm parents now in my office, so <laughs> carry on. Um, do we have the presentation? Up? Oh, well, no, I don't. I don't have it. I can. I pretty much have it memorized. So, in summary of what I was talking about with the zero emissions buses, um, we did apply for a low no grant with the FTA. Um, to start off small with our electric bus fleet, we're going to start with our small and medium duty vehicles. So our staff cars and our paratransit vans, we feel that's the best way for us to transition over to this electric bus side of things. The um, charging infrastructure is more prevalent right now than the infrastructure that you need for the larger buses. We need to do a, a real big overhaul of our bus yards to be able to convert there. But with the uh, small buses, you can use a smaller charging station that you see when you go to the grocery store or to a gas station or to Walmart. Um, we would have those on our bus yard for our vans. We also want to have enough to eventually have all of our staff cars becoming electric. And then we'll also have our employee lot and for visitors to be able to, to plug in their vehicles as well. So. We're, we're looking at it that way while we're studying what's ahead of us in the hydrogen and battery electric side of things. Um, I'm, I've just been named chairman of the Washington Metropolitan Bus Leaders Committee, which I'm really excited about because it gets OmniRide in there to help lead the region as we talk about a lot of things related to alternate technologies with fuel, how we plan our routes going forward, how we coordinate with each other. And I've seen a real shift in how we're working with each other. And I'm really proud of how the region is coming together uh, with the help of VDOT, DRPT, Transurban. This has really just been 
a real huge effort for all of us. And I can't wait for this service to begin. It's going to be something special for the county and the region. I'm so proud to be part of it. I'm glad to have all of you with us. And like I said, as we get into the phase with our outreach and our hearing, we really want that feedback and to hear from everybody to make sure we're providing the best service possible. All right, I'm gonna step back in. I'm not even sure. <laughs> Can you guys see me? Um, we can do some Q&A. We're, uh, we've got one computer here that's working. So um, if anybody does have a question, feel free to unmute. And again, we've got Brent and we've got Susan and the VDOT team and Perrin is right here next to me. Hi, Holly, this is Uriah Kaiser from Potomac Local News. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So I have uh, just a few questions. I'll, I'll start with um, the, I, I, the Reston, service can you just kind of I, I think my audio dropped off um a little bit more about the recap the rest and service uh, when it might begin and from what point to rest and will it serve yes hi, hi you right this is Perrin palestrand um i could explain that the route is proposed to start at the, the new balls ford road commuter lot in manassas and then operate non-stop to rest in with stops at the innovation station on the silver line along with numerous stops along Sunrise Valley and, and Sunset Hills Road on both sides of 267, trying to focus in on the main employment. Then it would swing back over 267 and terminate at the US Geological Survey. And then does this need to go to the board for approval or is this something that could start this next year, this year? When would you anticipate the service beginning? Yes, we're going to the board July 7th for authorization to go to public hearing. And then once we have the public hearing and public comment period in October, we'll go back to the commission for final approval. And then it would begin in December of, in conjunction with the I-66 express lanes opening up. I wanna ask about the Eastern side reconfiguration. Um, are you finding that um, a similar, a service similar to what will be implemented in Manassas Park, such as microtransit uh, would be ideal for portions of your Eastern service area uh, and what areas might those be um, that, that you're looking at? Maybe where a bus, uh, current bus line isn't uh, doing as well as others. I can't comment too much on the Eastern restructure because we're just starting that out. So we're evaluating every aspect of our service to see where microtransit would be possible in the future. We haven't identified exactly where that could be, but it is one aspect that we're looking at. And then as far as the rest of the service, as the evaluation process continues, we'll see what changes make sense um, within the, the, the approved budget that we would have for it. And my last question is about the Balls Ford commuter road lot. This is a, is this an expansion of the sort of existing lot there? Is this a, 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 new, uh, a, a new lot altogether and how many spaces will it have when it opens? I can defer to VDOT on that as far as it is a new lot, but as far as the number of spaces, I defer to VDOT and Transurban. I think I heard Susan say 1300, but I. Yeah, Susan, had, Susan, as far as the 10 o'clock conflict, she had to uh, drop off. It's a new lot and it's 1300 plus. Um, I think it's the final striping, there will be a little bit of a count, count, count to figure out 1300 and bump, bump. Yeah, so it's 1300 plus is the term we're using. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, anybody else? I know we're probably butting up against 10 o'clock. Yeah, we are. It's just off. But if anyone has a final question, feel free to unmute and uh, and ask away. Oh, I have a question. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Sorry. Uh, or my, my audio, something was going on with it earlier, and I wasn't able to hear a lot of the presentation. Are they going to um, email? Um, we the, are. We okay. absolutely are. Thanks for asking that. We will post um, the presentations to our website, um, the recording um, as well, and I will be sending the link to everyone that registered So, um, and everyone that's on the call. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. Ray, did I see that you had a question? And re yeah, an observation real quick. Yep. Um, it uh, on Germania Community College is moving one of their Stafford County campus north to the uh, to North Stafford on the Garrisonville Road. So and part of, and, and it's a kind of a twofold thing. One is the Marine Academy and 
The other is, of course, their new deal with George Mason University. Um, so that that's going to be interesting to see for FedEx, <laughs> the, the traffic counts. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank Brent as a Marine Corps brat born at Quantico. Um, I'd like to thank Brent for opening his presentation with an excellent shot of the Church of the Holy Grail. Uh, and a shout out to your Isaac Kaiser for putting out the Germania Community College uh, piece yesterday on Potomac Local. So, but that's going to be interesting to see what happens with that Garrisonville Road. So that was my observation. All right, thank you so much. And I know we're over, so thanks very much again to all of our presenters. I really appreciate your support and thanks to all who joined today. Um, I wish you a happy long weekend in advance, a happy fourth. And um, I hope I run into you all in person in the relatively near future. Take care. Future. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, 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 thanks,